You'd find it especially important this evening, I think, to have your Bible opened at 1 John chapter 5 and at this passage, which was our scripture reading from verse 6 to the end of verse 12. By now, almost everybody who has been at our evening services recently will know that we have been going through the first letter of John to discover its teaching on the whole theme of true Christian assurance. And there is no question that one of the key elements in true Christian assurance is genuine, personal, saving faith in Jesus Christ. This is why at the beginning and end of the passage we looked at last Sunday evening in chapter 5, verses 1 and 5, John is referring to believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He says in verse 1, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and there is evidence in saving faith itself of the new birth. If you have been truly born again, you will have exercised saving faith in Jesus Christ. Again, he refers to it at the end of that passage. Who is he that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, it is this theme of personal saving faith which John is elaborating for us from verse 6 to verse 12. And his main theme is how we come to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And his main answer is that saving faith, if it is to be genuine, is dependent on a valid testimony. We would recognize that in every sphere of life, that if our faith was to be well-founded, it would require to be faith in a valid, believable, reliable testimony. And the reasonableness of believing in Jesus is obviously linked to the validity of the testimony born to him. Now it's about that testimony. You would see the word or hear the word testimony repeated many times in these verses 6 to 12 of 1 John 5. And it's about that that John is speaking to us. Basically, he asks and answers four questions in this passage about the testimony that has been given to us concerning Jesus Christ come in the flesh to be the Savior of sinners. The first question is, who gave this testimony? Who provides the testimony that we are invited to believe in? And he answers that question for us first of all. The second question that he asks and answers is, in what form was this testimony given to us? The third question, why should we believe it? On what reasons do we believe the testimony that has been given to us about Jesus? And the final question, which John leaves to the end, is what actually is the content of this testimony? What does it say to us? Now, you will see that that's the theme of verses 11 and 12. This is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son, and so on. But I want us to look at this passage, which is often described as one of the most difficult passages in 1 John, in that way this evening. And I hope we may find it clear enough and understandable. There was a young lady in the congregation who was uh, listening to her parental 
afternoon talk today, and uh, somebody said within the family, here is one of the very difficult passages in 1 John that we are going to be turning to at the evening service tonight. Um, It's very hard to understand what John means. And the young lady replied, there's no problem about it. It's perfectly simple. And uh, perfectly simple you may find it to be, but we are going to look at it together in the form of answers to these four questions. And the first question, who provides the testimony about Jesus which we are invited to believe? And the only answer to that question that you can possibly come to conclude is John's answer is in verse 9. It is that the testimony that has been given to us about Jesus Christ is the testimony that God the Father has given about God the Son. Listen to verse 9. We accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given us about his Son. Now, this morning we were thinking about testifying and the giving of oaths and swearing about the nature of the truth. And here, in a sense, is God being cited as the one who bears testimony, gives us his word, goes on oath, as it were, to tell us the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. And this, therefore, is not human testimony that we believe when we are invited to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is divine testimony. It is God's own testimony which he has given to us. And we need to ask, having established the answer to that question, in what form has God given us this testimony which he has given about the Lord Jesus Christ? So that when the Philippian jailer, for example, is asking, what must I do to be saved? And the apostles answer him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. We need to ask, in what form has God given us the testimony about Jesus Christ, which he invites us to believe? And John's answer begins in verse 6, where he tells us that in the coming and dying of Jesus, God was bearing testimony that Jesus Christ was the only Savior of sinners, that he was God's Christ, that he was the Messiah, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophets and predictions concerning the suffering servant of Jehovah. Now, this is what John is referring to when he speaks in these somewhat mysterious words about the one who came by water and blood. Verse 6, this is the one, he says, who came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Now, the phrase is a very unique one. It's a phrase that we probably never come across in the Bible anywhere else, but it's clearly of great importance to John and probably was familiar to his readers because he repeats it again. He says he did not come by water only, but by water and blood. Now, 
The first answer, therefore, to the question, in what form does God bear testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ so that we are called to put our absolute faith, our total confidence, to rest everything we are upon Jesus Christ? The first answer to the question is, He has sent Him and has sent Him so that he came by water and by blood. Now, I suppose there has been a vast amount of discussion about what the meaning of that phrase is. He came by water, he came by blood, he did not come only by water, he came by water and blood. But I want to tell you what seems to me beyond question to be the most likely understanding of these words. I think the most likely explanation is that it refers to Jesus' baptism at the beginning of his ministry and to his death at the conclusion of his public ministry. And the commonest way of understanding this, and the most obvious one, I think, would be that the water refers to his baptism, that the blood refers to his death on the cross. Now, you will remember, perhaps, that it was uniquely on these two occasions that God, as it were, broke open the heavens and bore testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior he had sent. At his baptism, for example, in Matthew chapter 3, we read that as he came up out of the water, what happened was that heaven opened, and the Holy Spirit came down upon him, and the voice of God was heard speaking about him. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Phrases that come together from the prophecy of Isaiah. Now what John is referring to, I believe, in the water by which he came, was that occasion when in his baptism God bore testimony and said this, is my son the beloved one. In him I am well pleased. That is, it is in him that salvation is to be wrought. It is in him that sin is to be born. It is in him that I have eternally decreed a savior for sinful humanity will be found. That's God's testimony. And that's an historical testimony, let me press upon you. This is not John's ideas that he has. This is a reference to history. When the Lord Jesus came to the day of his baptism, and God opened heaven and identified him as the Savior. Now the same thing happened at his death, do you remember? when he shed his blood upon the cross, and when he died in the place of sinners, God once again reached down from heavenly glory. And as it were, he opened the heavens in order to demonstrate that here in the death of Jesus Christ, a new and living way had been opened into the presence of God for sinners. How did he do it? Well, he did it in the most dramatic of ways. When the great curtain that separated the holy place, the presence of God from every other, was torn in two significantly from the top to the bottom. And the epistle to the Hebrews tells us that was a testimony that God had opened a new and living way in to the presence of his holiness. So here is this double testimony which God gave, the water of baptism 
where he identified himself with sinners and where God identified him as the only Savior and the blood of the cross where God testified by the rent veil that this was where access to him could be obtained. So when he says, this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, he did not come by water only, but by water and blood, he is telling us of the testimony of God, because that's what he's speaking about in the whole passage, which was given at the baptism and at the death of Jesus Christ. Now, if you are going to say to me this evening, how do I know that it's only at the cross of Jesus Christ that God forgives sinners? How do I know that it's only at the cross of Jesus that God reconciles us to himself? How do I know that only in Jesus Christ has God accomplished this miracle of reconciliation? I tell you, there are two places where God has rent the heavens and laid his finger, as it were, on Jesus Christ, come in the flesh, identifying himself with sinners, bearing our sin by the shedding of his blood. And these two places are his baptism and his death on the cross. But, John says, there is a third witness. Notice towards the end of verse 6. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. And there are therefore three that testify. The Spirit, the water, and the blood and the three are in agreement. Now, that may be a reference to the coming down of the Holy Spirit and alighting upon Jesus and identifying him as the Son of God and the Savior. Or it may, in addition, be a reference to the Holy Spirit bearing personal witness in the heart of the believing Christian that he is indeed a child of God, because that is another thing that the Holy Spirit does and brings assurance to us for that reason. Or it may also be a reference to the testimony of the Holy Spirit in Holy Scripture. How does God then testify through the Holy Spirit concerning the Lord Jesus Christ? He may testify of him on that day at his baptism when he came down and John and Matthew says, we saw the Spirit of God coming down upon him. Or it may be that it is a reference to the Holy Spirit bearing personal witness in our hearts that Christ is indeed the only Savior. Just pause for a moment and let me ask you, when you were drawn to Jesus Christ, I would suggest to you that one of the things that you experienced was that God the Holy Spirit began to work in your heart to bear testimony to you that Jesus Christ was the Savior you needed. That's where God begins a work of His grace. It is the Holy Spirit's ministry to do that. And He then evokes faith a believing, a saving interest in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the same Holy Spirit thereafter bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. There is this internal ministry testifying of the Holy Spirit within our hearts. And of course, the great 
testimony of the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth, is also in Holy Scripture. It is here holy men spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It is here, especially in this case in the New Testament Scripture, that the Holy Spirit is testifying of Jesus. However these things may be, there are three agreeing witnesses. And in verses 7 and 8, John points to them. There are the three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. Now, because of their testimony, we ought, John is saying, to agree with that testimony. And that's the next question. Who has given the testimony? In what form does it come to us? And thirdly, why should we receive and rest upon it? Well, notice what John says in verse 9. We accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because he is God. Notice, we accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his Son. Now, this, of course, links into what we were speaking about this morning. The reason that we need to require oaths of one another in all areas of life is that we cannot accept the simple word of a fellow human being. We know that we are all of us liable to untruths. We are inclined by our sinful nature to lie rather than to tell the truth. And therefore we ask people in a court, will you swear by Almighty God that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And we are so used to the idea. You get it in, in, in our human daily speech. We say to one another, do you really mean that? It's one of the things we say when somebody says something that's extraordinary perhaps to us. We say, did you really mean what you just said? Is that we are saying, in other words, empty words because we are so used to have empty words spoken to us by other people. But when you're dealing with God, my friends, you are dealing with one who cannot lie because he is God. His word is truth. And God's testimony is therefore a testimony which is to be believed because he is God. We accept man's testimony, he says. That is when he's on oath. But God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God concerning His Son. Now, that is what we are dealing with when we are talking about the testimony God has borne about Jesus Christ. It is presented to you, and then the question is, what do you do with it? Well, now, let me point out to you precisely what John says we are doing if we refuse the testimony of God about Jesus Christ. That is the testimony at his baptism, the testimony at his death, the testimony by the Holy Spirit, the testimony of Holy Scripture. What are we doing when we refuse the testimony of God? Notice what he says. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. Now, of course, that's exactly 
what Satan was seeking to bring Adam and Eve to do in the Garden of Eden. He gave them the sinister counsel that God did not mean what he said. Did God really say, he says? Don't believe it. Did God really say you will die? Of course you will not die. And clearly, the world has been battling with that lie ever since, and there is a very real sense in which when we are faced with the testimony of God about his only Son, and we refuse it, we are looking God in the eye and saying to him, you are nothing more than a liar. Now let me just point out to you that that is why unbelief is not an amiable weakness or a condition of very clever, unpersuadable people. Unbelief is the worst of sins because it is calling God a liar. And unbelief, therefore, is something that as Jesus marveled at it, do you remember? He marveled at their unbelief. We ought to tremble at it. Let me just point to you that unbelief in relation to Holy Scripture is something we ought to tremble at. Why? Because it is calling God a liar. That's why. He has given us the testimony. And we are saying we don't accept it. Now you go into an ordinary court of justice, as I do regularly, and find people there waiting to give testimony. And if the advocate is saying to the man who is giving his testimony... I don't believe a word that you are saying. You will quite often find the man saying, Sir, are you calling me a liar? And he usually responds with some phrase like, I am saying that you are economical with the truth. But of course he's calling him a liar. And let's not beat about the bush when we refuse to believe God, we are calling him a liar. And John could not make that more clear. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his son. Never, never, never Take the sin of unbelief lightly. And when I hear people jocularly say, Oh, I am one of your old unbelievers, you know. I think within my heart, my dear friend, you do not know what you are speaking about. Because you are taking it upon you to call God a liar. Who gave this testimony? It is the testimony of God concerning his Son. In what form did he give it to us? In this threefold form of the water, the blood, and the Spirit. Why should we believe it? Because it is the testimony of God, not the testimony of men. And finally, what is the content of this testimony that God has given to us? Well, you will see that it's in verses 11 and 12. This is the testimony 
God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Now here John brings us to the very core of the Christian gospel. Notice several things which he is saying to us here. He is saying to us that the gift of God in the gospel is eternal life. Now that's an important thing, of course, when somebody is speaking about and someone else is worried about assurance. What God has given you when he came to do a work of grace in your life is eternal life. By definition, eternal life cannot end. So if you have received eternal life from God, you have received something that nobody can take from you, that will never come to a conclusion and which you can never lose. Otherwise, it wouldn't be eternal life. But notice, this is the gift of God in the gospel. It is eternal life. You will notice it is a gift. It is not something that anybody can ever do one mortal thing to earn. It is a gift from God, not a prize to be earned, or a reward to be merited. It is a gift from God. But you notice the next thing which is of great importance. What God gives in the gospel, in his grace, is not a thing, nor an experience, but a person. This life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. And correspondingly, he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So the whole glory of the experience of grace of which John wants to bring lasting assurance to these believers, is that it is the receiving of the Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory. We possess him when we have believed on him. Now you may say to me, I thought you said We had to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what John was talking about all through this passage. Now it's speaking about possessing him, having him. Well, let me ask you just to turn back a little to the gospel John wrote. In order that we might come to believe that Jesus was the Christ. That's why he said he wrote the gospel, that you might come to believe that Jesus is the Christ. He wrote the epistle that those who believe might know that they possessed eternal life. Now look at chapter 1 of John's gospel. And at verse 11, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. There is the great tragedy of all the ages in the coming of Jesus Christ into the world. His own did not receive him. Yet, now here's the phrase to look at, yet to all who received him, that is, To those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So you will notice two things that are set alongside each other, which are really irreplaceable, which are really interconnected. Those who believed in his name and those who received him. And the reason these two things are interchangeable 
is that the eternal life which God gives to those who believe is found in his Son. And being a Christian is having Christ living in you. Christ, says Paul, lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. But saving faith has meant this. I have received the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you become a Christian, you do not simply subscribe to a series of beliefs or creeds. You do not, do not simply adopt a new way of life. You receive a person. Oh, how many people have never really grasped this. You receive a person, and that person is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, to whom the Father bore testimony. And said, this is my beloved son. This is the Savior. This is the one who will bear your sin. And we receive him. So saving faith, says the Westminster Catechism, is to rest upon and receive Jesus Christ as my only Savior. In him is eternal life, and eternal life is in him. You can't have eternal life without having Christ, and you can't have Christ without having eternal life. And John is going to go on in his concluding remarks, as the NIV calls it. What a an insult to the apostle to describe any part of Scripture as my concluding remarks, you know. But he is going to tell us in his concluding remarks how we may have this glorious assurance of eternal life in Jesus Christ. I tell you tonight, my dear friends, if you have Christ, you have eternal life. If you do not have Christ, you do not have eternal life. It's as simple and as solemn as that. May God help us that we will not go out through these doors until we are able to say, I have Christ. Blessed be God, we began this service singing a hymn that made us cry hallelujah. That's the greatest cause of hallelujahs on the believer's lips. I have Christ. And there is nothing in the universe more that you'll want or need. Let us pray. Our great God and Father, we bless and worship and adore you for the testimony you have borne to your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us by your Holy Spirit that we may be enabled this evening to make our calling and election sure, to know that we have Christ not merely connections with the church or belief in doctrine, but that we may have Christ. Oh, in your mercy, grant us the reality of that for the glory of your name. Amen.